Hi, welcome to the Thriller Vault podcast. I'm Luke Richardson and today I'm sharing with you a story set in the slums of Mumbai, India called Slumdog Escape. It's written by myself and Stephen Moore and as I say, I will be narrating it. Let's get into it. Rahul. Sometimes in life, you just have to run. Despite not yet reaching his eighth birthday, Rahul knew that more than most. He loved running. He remembered running on the beaches as a boy, spray kicking up high as his feet pounded the sand. He remembered running away to the big city when his parents died and his nasty uncle tried to take him in. He remembered running through Mumbai in those first few weeks, poor but free, running from stall holders with stolen tomatoes under his shirt or running from a security guard with a loaf of warm bread in his hands, running to Rahul came naturally. It was as though he was born to do it. Rahul peered out into the darkness and tried to work out where the men were. He could hear at least two of them snoring on the far side, but the other was silent. There were usually two men, but sometimes there were three. These men were supposed to look after Rahul and the other children, but Rahul didn't think they did a very good job. A few stale bits of bread and a glass of dirty water at the end of the day was not being looked after. Rahul could do a better job on his own. Rahul pushed against the door to the cell-like room he shared with a dozen other children. As he'd suspected, it was open. Earlier in the night, he'd listened closely as the boss man closed the door but hadn't heard the bolt slide home. Maybe the boss man was very tired after his late night of drinking beer and watching television. Maybe the boss man should get to bed a little bit earlier. The door's rusted hinges squeaked. Rahul froze. He listened to the darkness. The men continued to snore. Rahul pushed open the door another few inches and then slipped through. He glanced over his shoulder and imagined the other children sleeping in the dark. He longed to free them too, but tonight there just wasn't time. He couldn't risk the noise waking up one of the men. Rahul promised that he would come back for the other children as soon as he could. He padded across the silent room, feeling each step with his bare feet. He knew that after the men had been drinking, empty bottles were often left across the floor. If Rahul kicked one of them, it would be game over for sure. Rahul counted out ten paces and then turned to the right. He was now in the corridor which led to the front door. He just hoped the front door would be unlocked too. Rahul counted out fifteen more paces along the uneven floor. Something scuttled in the darkness. An animal, probably a rat. Animals didn't concern Rahul. Humans caused the real pain. Rahul reached the door. He fumbled around in the dark for the handle. The metal was cold, even in Mumbai's humid air. He held his breath and turned the handle. The mechanism moved, then clicked. The door swung open. A vertical bar of light streamed in. Rahul breathed in, intoxicated by it. He glanced behind him, teetering with possibility. The boss man had said that Rahul was one of the lucky ones. He said that they were a family, that they looked after each other. But Rahul didn't think that was true. Rahul peered through the gap and inhaled. The city's fumes were especially noxious and exciting tonight. The lights of a car swung across the opposite building and then disappeared. Rahul took a deep breath and stepped out into the night. Oi! Where do you think you're going? The voice rooted Rahul to the spot. A figure stepped from the darkness. The man rummaged in his trouser pocket and pulled out a lighter. He struck it and lit the cigarette clamped between his lips. For a moment, his face was bathed in orange. Rahul recognised him. The boss man. Well, where do you think you're going? Rahul's eyes darted left and right. The boss man stepped towards him. Rahul darted away. His feet slapped three times against the ground before a thick arm closed around his neck. No, you don't, the boss man hissed an inch from his ear. You don't get to leave like that. I told you, 
We're family. And family stays together. Kayla. Kayla emerged, exhausted and bleary-eyed, into the chaotic arrivals hall of Mumbai International Airport. On first glimpse, the place looked more like a riot than an organised system. Scrums of men carrying overstuffed luggage hustled this way and that. Women herded children towards faraway exits. Taxi drivers touted for business. Hawkers sold drinks and snacks. Security men in military uniforms lounged against the wall, smoking, proud of their big guns and paying nobody any attention at all. Indian holy men in bright orange robes, glamorous European women in designer clothes, foreign nuns, well-dressed bankers from all corners of the globe jostled shoulder to shoulder, all vying for the same delicious breaths of hot and humid air. Kayla was excited by the variety, intoxicated by the contrast, and couldn't wait to explore. She took a deep breath to steady the pounding of her heart. A Miss Stone? Miss, Miss Stone? Kayla turned at the timid yet high-pitched voice, surprised she's heard her own name over the thunderous din. Miss Stone? Miss Kayla Stone? Yes, yes, I'm Kayla, she said. Ah, I am a pleasure to meet you, Miss Stone. A young Indian man in a bright red shirt stood behind her, his palms placed across his chest. My name is Dilip, and I'm your driver to take you to the, oh, very excellent Kalaba guest house. Oh, uh, hello, um, thanks, OK. Kayla glanced at the airport surging around her. She felt suddenly uncomfortable. How did this young man know who she was? Mr Kermy, owner of the Kalaba guest house, told me I was waiting for a beautiful woman with blonde hair. Kayla glanced at another blonde-haired woman sauntering towards the exit. He said that also it was your first time in India, isn't it? People who are coming to India for the first time are very easy to spot. Follow me, Miss Kayla. I take your backpack. Before Kayla had the chance to respond, Dilip grabbed her pack and hoisted it over his impossibly skinny shoulders. Then, with several wiggles of the head, Dilip beckoned Kayla to follow. All right then, Kayla whispered to herself, her worldly possessions heading for the exit. I'll just have to go with it. Two anxiety-inducing shoulder-barging minutes later, they passed through the exit doors and into the sweating city air. The cacophony of voices inside were little more than a distant murmur against screaming car horns. Just up here, Dillit said, guiding them past three brightly painted buses belching thick black smoke into the air. Kayla followed, pushing through crowds of people, a bag thudded to the concrete beside her. Kayla looked up. A man stood on the roof of the bus, pulling luggage from a roof rack and then dropping it carelessly to the ground. Come on, come on, no time for waitings. Dilip's voice cut through the melee. Kayla turned and rushed after him. Here we are, Dilip said, reaching a tiny yellow and black car. He opened the trunk, slipped Kayla's bag inside, then skipped around to the driver's door. Kayla slipped into the worn rear seats. The green digital clock on the dash informed her that it was just after midday. Without waiting for Kayla to find the seatbelt, Dillip crunched the car into gear. Kicking the accelerator, he sent the taxi screeching into gridlocked traffic. For several minutes, they jostled their way through, accelerating hard for a few feet before violently braking. Finally, they made it to the freeway. Sprawling slums of colourful, crumbling shacks flanked the road on both sides. The tiny huts were constructed from random sections of corrugated tin, ripped tarpaulins, cardboard boxes and just about anything that might offer a little protection from the rain or sun. Kayla watched a group of women dressed in iridescent saris. Their smiles broad and their eyes bright pick their way along the side of the freeway. A series of wildly disconnected images flashed past. Pollution blurting trucks, cars held together with tape, roofless sports cars, decrepit, garishly adorned buses jammed to bursting like tins of human sardines. Cows, their homeliness apparent in vain. 
men working, others sleeping, women chasing away stray dogs with sticks, children playing with trash while goats tried to eat the same trash. Kayla's mind spun with it, and yet the adventure was thrilling. The city of Shacks gave way to an expansive boulevard running parallel to a glimmering stretch of ocean. This, this is Back Bay, Miss Kayla, and the Arabian Sea beyond. It is beautiful, isn't it? Dilip said, turning away from the road for far too long. Yes, yes, yes it is, Kayla stuttered, her eyes still struggling to take it all in. It was very beautiful. Mumbai was crazy, chaotic, misunderstood, scary and different, but beautiful too. Rahul. The boss man stepped back and leant against a crumbling wall. Sweat drenched his grubby shirt. Several buttons had long since given up trying to contain his stomach and pinged away never to be seen again. The boss man plucked a pack of biddy cigarettes from his pocket, lit one and inhaled deeply. He looked around. Several pairs of fear-filled eyes watched him. Where is he? The boss man spat. Suddenly, a boy was pushed into the centre of the room. The boss man dropped into a crouch and peered at the small child. Now, Rahul, we need to talk about what you tried to do last night. His voice was soft and calm, almost fatherly. Nothing, nothing. I didn't try to do anything. Rahul shook his head and shivered despite the cloying heat of the night. The boss man nodded and smiled. You know you are here because you are special. He spread his arms out, indicating the other children nearby. You are all special. You are very important to us. We need each other. And because we need you, we want to take care of you. We are family. The boss man stepped forwards and Rahul tried to back away. Another man, known as Weasel, due to his diminutive size, stepped out of the shadows and held Rahul in position. This is why it makes us very sad when you try to run away. The boss man picked up a length of thick bamboo. Rahul's eyes flared, watching the cane. He'd seen this before. He tried to squirm and wriggle away, but the weasel held him tight. Boss man nodded and Weasel pulled away Rahul's shirt, exposing his ribs which jutted beneath his skin. Boss man swung the bamboo high. It whistled through the air. He swished the cane down and it cracked against Rahul's chest. Rahul screamed, his voice echoing for a long moment through the whole building. Then the whipping sound returned and again and again and again. Finally, the boss man dropped the blood-stained bamboo to the floor. He straightened up and addressed the assembled children. This is what you make me do when you try to run away, he said. This is your fault. The boss man pointed at Rahul. Weasel forced Rahul up from the floor and made him stand straight. His chest, back and face were marked with several bloody gashes. The boss man leaned in close to the child. Tonight, Rahul, I need double from you to pay back your mistake. And don't try anything, because we will be watching. Do you understand? Rahul nodded. Silent tears made trails across his filthy cheeks. And if you fail, the boss man said, standing at his full height, I will take out one of your eyes. Kayla. An hour later, Kayla swung open the window of her room in the Kalaba guest house. A welcome breeze drifted in, carrying with it the aromas of street food, incense and the tang of the ocean. Kayla felt the weariness of countless hours on the move fade and her hunger swell. The city enticed her through the open window. I'll eat first, Kayla said to herself, then take a rest. After a quick freshen up and a change of clothes, Kayla checked on her phone for good food places near the guest house. She'd noted down several, but was particularly excited to visit one, Leopold's Café and Bar. Two minutes later, Kayla meandered more or less in the direction of Leopold's. Purposefully leaving the phone in her bag, she didn't mind if she got a little bit lost on the way. 
Kayla sensed a good vibe on the street as she made her way northeast towards Leopold's, nestled somewhere behind the imposing and iconic Gateway of India monument. Kayla knew nobody in the city and revelled in the freedom of leaving her regular life in Sydney behind for a while. It wasn't that Kayla didn't like Sydney, but she was pleased to have the opportunity to see a bit of the world before she settled into her future. A future that, right now, she couldn't decide on the direction of. Nearing the centre of Calaba, Kayla's senses came alive with the dizzying sights and sounds and smells of India's trademark chaos. She turned and carried on, hunger and the desire for an icy beer driving her forwards. Ahead, a large red sign hung above the open arched doorways of the restaurant. Kayla recognised it from the guidebook and stopped dead on the thin pavement, causing two women in bright blue headscarves to shuffle past her. Leopold's Cafe and Bar, the sign said. Excuse me, miss, came a weak voice from a few feet away. I need money for food. Kayla saw a small boy, no older than six or seven, his hands cupped before him. Although Kayla had seen countless people on the walk who appeared to be living in poverty, none had yet to approach her. She was about to walk on when something on the boy's face drew her attention. He had a series of red gashes up the back of his neck and cheeks as though someone had gone at him with a cane. Kayla dropped into a crouch and looked at the boy. Who did this to you? What happened? she said, suddenly concerned. This nothing, the boy said. To Kayla, his expression said the opposite. She glanced around as though looking for someone to help. People on the street continued with their lives as though the boy didn't even exist. What's your name? Kayla said. Rahul, the boy said. You, you have money? Rahul lifted a dirty hand towards his mouth. Suddenly, Kayla felt a blow of helplessness. There really was nothing she could do for this poor young boy. OK, Rahul, Kayla said, pulling a few rupee notes from her bag. Take this, get something to eat, and please stay away from whoever did this to you. Yes, miss, thank you, thank you, Rahul said, accepting the money and nodding excitedly. Kayla stood with a heavy heart and then turned towards the restaurant. Rahul. Rahul shoved the money deep inside his pocket and couldn't believe his luck. The lady had given him more money than he'd ever seen before. He longed to pull the notes back out again and properly count them, but he knew that was a bad idea. Bossman would be very unhappy if he knew that Rahul had been counting the money in public. The first rule they were taught was to look as poor and sorrowful as possible. Rahul cupped his hands as another pair of tourists walked past. This pair didn't even glance down. As the tourists sauntered away, Rahul was suddenly struck with an idea. Why should he give this money to Boss Man? Rahul had asked the lady for the money, and she had given it to him. Therefore, Rahul thought it was probably his to spend as he saw fit. Rahul's mind filled with all the tasty food he could buy with the money. Maybe he could even buy something for the other children too. Then he froze. Bossman would take the money, whether Rahul liked it or not. That was unless Rahul escaped, properly this time. Rahul glanced up and then down the street. He couldn't see Bossman or any of his corrupt friends. That didn't mean they weren't watching though. Rahul's shoulders slumped at the thought that his good fortune would be spent on beers for boss man and his friends. He slipped his hand inside the pocket and felt the notes. There were at least three of them, maybe more. The movement caused the welts all over his back and chest to ache once more. Rahul focused on the money and tried to forget the pain. With that much money, Rahul could get far, far away from Bossman and all his corrupt friends. Rahul knew what he should do. He should ride on one of the overnight trains, like the one that had brought him here to Mumbai all those years ago. He could go south. People always said that once they left Mumbai, they'd go south. South sounded like a good idea to Rahul. 
In the south, he would find himself in another city where Bossman couldn't reach him. Rahul glanced around again. Bossman wasn't nearby, or at least he didn't think so. Rahul made a decision and stepped away from the door of the restaurant. No one shouted at him. No one came for him. He took another step, his senses on high alert. Still, no one came. Then Rahul ran. Then Rahul heard the voice. Kayla. Kayla stepped inside and looked around. A dozen ceiling fans turned lazily. Large mirrors adorned the walls. A waiter in a red jacket hurried towards her. The smell of spices hung thick in the heavy air. Welcome to Leopold's, the waiter said without smiling. Kayla glanced around for an empty table. Not a chance. Leopold's was a must-visit venue on any traveller's Mumbai itinerary since the brilliant yet controversial book Shantaram stormed to fame almost two decades ago. Kayla had read the epic tale of crime and love and loyalty set in the wild streets of Mumbai and for years had been eager to come here herself and see how accurate the story was. With no tables available, Kayla, naturally shy and happiest in her own company, turned to leave. Miss, miss, please sit there, the waiter barked, pointing her towards a spare seat at a table of rowdy tourists. Kayla looked from the table to the snarling traffic beyond the door. She could come back later when, you want seat or no, the waiter snarled. Sure, Kayla said, crossing towards the table. She was here, so she might as well do it. Do you mind if I join you? Come, sit down, grab a beer, said one of the girls at the table. Yeah, join us, yelled a tall man with a baseball cap. He might as well have had the stars and stripes draped around his shoulders. Kayla hesitated again. She didn't want to leave, nor did she want to appear ungrateful. She took a subtle deep breath and introduced herself to the table. Thanks, Kayla muttered, dropping into the hard wooden seat. I'm Kayla, I'm from Sydney. What's up, Kayla from Sydney? parroted the American. I'm Bryant from Texas. The others around the table introduced themselves too. The waiter thumped an icy bottle of Kingfisher beer in front of Kayla. Within a minute, Kayla was fielding all the questions backpackers live by. Why are you here? Where did you arrive from? Where are you going next? Have you got any hash? Kayla only knew the answers to half of these questions. I'm just happy to be here, she told Rolf, an older Swiss guy with a red bandana looped around his neck. We've been here a few weeks now, said Paula, a large Welsh girl whose sunburned cheeks did more than hint at her Celtic heritage. We're almost locals. How are you enjoying Mumbai? Kayla asked, settling into the conversation. It's amazing here. Beer is cheap, girls are even cheaper, said Carlito, a young Mexican backpacker. The Mexican winked, stood up and then invited himself to sit with a group of young women at another table. Rolf shrugged, rolling his eyes. Don't worry, he never succeeds. How are you finding the poverty and all the beggars? asked the sole Canadian among them, Kendra. Her grimace did nothing to hide how she felt about it all. It's heartbreaking, isn't it? Kayla said, instantly reminded of Rahul just a few minutes before. It just, just makes me feel so, so powerless. Yeah, it's tough for sure, declared Bryant, Kendra's boyfriend. Most of these guys have nothing, he said, pointing out into the street. Kayla turned and saw Rahul still there, his cupped hands outstretched. Her soul ached with the desire to do more to help. Ooh, man, they're so dirty, Kendra crowed. There's just got to be more we can do, Kayla said, her stare hardening. My dad says it's wrong to give money to beggars, Bryant said, almost shouting. The chatter around the table fell silent. He says they're just lazy and that it doesn't help. They've become dependent on it rather than trying to better themselves. Bryant stared at Kayla through hazy eyes. Kayla glanced back at Rahul, just in time to see him look one way and then the other. I think your dad's right, Kendra said, 
How will they ever improve things for themselves if they just beg all the time? Kayla glanced between the faces of her drinking partners. Glowing smiles of welcome had now become the hard stares of drunken righteousness. Kayla didn't know whether it was a good or bad thing to give these starving street kids money, but to dismiss it so flippantly was certainly out of order. Rolf ordered another round of beers, and the conversation gradually resumed at the table. Hey, Kayla, we're going out to Elephanta tomorrow. Do you want to come? said Warren, an oversized Aussie with a military style haircut. We'll get dinner and drinks after. And maybe you and I could, you know, he winked. A commotion at the door drew Kayla's attention. Rahul darted away down the street and was followed a moment later by a large Indian man. The man shouted something at Rahul and then gave chase. There's always something we can do, Kayla muttered, rising to her feet with the speed of a jack-in-a-box. Yeah, we can, girl. Warren said, looking as though he couldn't quite believe his luck. No, no, not that. Definitely not that, Kayla said. I've got to go. She dumped a note on the table. She rushed out into the street just in time to see the big man push his way through a crowd of people, shoving two of them to the floor. Kayla glanced back at the tourists, who had already resumed conversation. Maybe Kayla was new here. Maybe she didn't know how things worked in India but she knew when something was wrong. Kayla set off at a sprint after the man. She darted around a group of people by jumping in the road. A truck sounded its horn and Kayla leapt out of the way an instant before being crushed. She reached a junction and stopped, her sneakers sliding over wet cobbles. No, no! Kayla spun at the sound of a child crying out. Her eyes panned one way, then the other searching for the source of the yelling. The evening was wearing on and the usually bustling streets of Calaba were quietening down. A few groups of people gathered outside cafes, several couples strolled arm in arm, street food vendors went about their business. Did no one else hear that child calling out? Did I hear it wrong? Kayla whispered to herself. If it were a child's cry, Kayla knew either no one had heard it or they simply didn't care. No! Ah! came the cry again. This time there was no mistaking it. Kayla's eyes followed the high-pitched and desperate scream. A hundred feet down the side street she saw movement. Kayla's eyes locked on two men who were partly obscured by a filthy truck which was stopped at the side of the street. Kayla ran towards the scene. Quick! Quick! Help me! Kayla yelled to a street vendor as she raced towards the movement. A capable sportswoman, Kayla covered the uneven ground quickly, but not quickly enough. When she was still 50 yards away, she saw a large man pull a boy around to the rear of the truck. Without a doubt in her mind, Kayla knew that it was Rahul. A smaller man flung open the rear of the truck and the big man tossed Rahul inside. In the gloom of the truck's interior, Kayla saw Rahul's beaten up face. His expression was one of sheer terror. The man slammed the truck's doors and then got into the cab. The engine growled to life and the truck pulled away. Kayla powered on towards the vehicle. With many years of surfing and taekwondo behind her, Kayla closed the distance in just a few seconds. Stop! Kayla yelled, slamming her hands on the truck's side. Her fingers clawed at the metal, trying to get hold of something. She noticed the words, Bats of Bombay, printed on the rusting metal. No, no, stop! Kayla shouted again, hammering against the dented metal. Stop now! Someone! Help! Tyres screeched and spun, kicking up grit and dust. The engine roared and the vehicle shot forwards. The movement knocked Kayla off balance and she sprawled to the ground. The truck accelerated ahead and then turned a corner, two wheels completely leaving the asphalt. Kayla struggled back onto her feet and looked around frantically. She expected to see other people racing to help, but no one came. The image of Rahul's terrified expression flashed through Kayla's mind. Then a drunken voice overtook her memory. Don't help anyone unless they help themselves. 
No way, Kayla said into the night. If something's wrong, then it's wrong. She made a split second decision and set off at a sprint. She reached the corner in time to see the truck swing around two parked cars. Though it was late and the area was quiet, Kayla hoped that the roads were busy enough for her to catch up. She raced on, driven by her inner sense of injustice. No one else was helping, so she needed to. Up ahead, the truck's one functioning brake light flashed. It was slowing. Kayla gritted her teeth and pushed harder. Her feet pounded relentlessly across uneven ground. Kayla's hopes rose as she closed in on the truck. Then, the truck reached an open stretch of road and accelerated away, suddenly disappearing from her view. Kayla slid to a stop, crouched to her haunches and exhaled. The heavily polluted air burned her throat. Kayla spun around. She figured that she was now somewhere in the narrow street near Calaba Market. Several sets of eyes watched her from dark doorways and makeshift shelters. A pack of dogs sniffed around discarded food wrappers, starved just like the street kids. No one was interested. No one cared. Kayla's fists clenched as rage overtook her. Her mind spun through what might happen to Rahul, and none of the scenarios were good. Miss, you want tuk-tuk? Kayla turned to see a grinning face behind the wheel of a yellow and black tuk-tuk. There were thousands of the converted three-wheeled motorcycle taxis in Mumbai, and they were the perfect way to navigate the city. Miss, tuk-tuk, the driver said again. Yes, Kayla shouted, jumping in the back. That way, and fast. The tuk-tuk driver pulled back on the throttle and the small vehicle shot forwards. Kayla was almost thrown from the seat. She grabbed hold of the frame, clinging on as tightly as possible. The buildings either side of the road merged into a blur as they picked up speed. The small engine grumbled and then howled. They swerved to the left, driving in the direction of the Nariman Point district. The tuk-tuk skirted a wheelless truck sitting up on bricks and three men squatting around a small fire. Kayla clung on tighter as they took another corner and then suddenly emerged onto the wide expanse of Marine Drive. The calm waters of Back Bay glistened beneath the moon. There were more people out here, enjoying the cooler air after another stifling, humid day. There was more traffic too. Kayla searched for the truck with bats of Bombay printed on its doors. Her heart climbed into her throat. The vibrations from the tuk-tuk rattled her bones. The tuk-tuk driver tore back on the throttle and powered past the truck. The deep throng of the truck's horn bellowed just inches from Kayla's ear. There, Kayla shouted, bats of Bombay, you see it? She leant forwards and pointed at the truck as it skidded across an intersection, barely missing a taxi coming the other way. The tuk-tuk was just 200 feet behind now. The tuk-tuk driver pulled over into the opposite lane to pass two buses parked side by side. Horns cried and Kayla's stomach turned to iron. They missed an oncoming truck by inches. Kayla gripped tight as the tuk-tuk swung left and then right, this time narrowly avoiding a wandering cow. OK, OK, slow down, she yelled as they got within 50 feet of the truck. Kayla didn't think the men knew she was on their tail, and right now, following them to their destination made more sense. The truck swerved left and then turned off Marine Drive. This road was smaller and darker. Tall buildings stood on either side, blocking out the glow from the polluted sky. The road was quieter too. The tuk-tuk driver closed the distance quickly. The truck growled on, picking up speed. The tall buildings were now replaced by low, boxy, concrete buildings surrounded by shacks. Kerosene lamps glittered through open doors of the huts as residents settled down for the evening. The truck shrieked to a stop and then turned into a dark and narrow back street. The tuk-tuk squealed to a stop too pausing at the mouth of the back street. The city was suddenly silent. The tuk-tuk's engine pattered. Further down the back street, something creaked and then clanged. 
Kayla stared hard but couldn't see anything in the darkness. The tuk-tuk driver turned the handlebars and the weak headlight illuminated the first dozen feet of the road. Stained metal shutters lined both sides. Overflowing dumpsters allowed just enough room for one vehicle to pass. OK, go, Kayla yelled, tapping the driver on the back. Go down there. Miss, what are you doing? The driver pulled the tuk-tuk down the narrow road. The small vehicle bounced violently from side to side. This street, plenty dangerous. Plenty bad people in Mumbai. I'm doing what's right, Kayla muttered. Wait, slow down, slow down, stop here. The tuk-tuk's thin tyres crunched to a stop on the unpaved road. Litter gusted in the breeze. There wasn't anyone around. Even the street dogs seemed to be avoiding this area. Not good place, miss, the driver said, looking at Kayla with concern. Need to go. We should not be here. Kayla didn't hear. She was focused on the truck, which had just materialised from the gloom. Squinting, she could just read the words printed on the vehicle's rear doors. Bats of Bombay. Kayla handed the tuk-tuk driver a bundle of rupees. His eyes lit up. The amount was probably a week's wages. Not stay here, miss, he said. Bad area. Should go. You go. Thank you, Kayla said, climbing from the tuk-tuk. The tuk-tuk driver shook his head as if to say, just another stupid tourist getting into trouble. The driver spun the tuk-tuk around and disappeared back in the direction they'd come. Kayla ran towards the truck and ducked in behind one of the many overflowing dumpsters. As her eyes adjusted to the darkness, she saw movement beside the truck. As her eyes became more astute, she noticed two men emerge from the vehicle. The large thug Kayla had seen bundle the boy into the truck a few minutes before came first. He pulled a packet of cigarettes from his trousers and placed one between his lips. A match flared in the darkness, allowing Kayla a better view of his appearance. His clothes were stained and his fingers discoloured. He barked orders and another man shuffled out from beside the truck. While the men were looking the other way, Kayla scampered closer. She ducked in behind an oil drum, which reeked as though it were filled with sewage. Trying not to think about the contents of the drum, Kayla focused on the activity, which was now just 20 feet away. The big man shouted something in a language Kayla didn't understand. The smaller man stepped up to the truck and opened the rear doors. The rusted hinges screeched. Kayla leaned from her hiding place to improve her view. A light in the back of the truck snapped on. Sickness rose in Kayla's throat. The truck contained at least 12 children. Each of them gazed out with hungry, pain-ridden eyes. The big man bellowed into the truck and the children reluctantly shuffled forwards. The brute then held out a hand the size of a T-bone steak. The first child, a girl who couldn't be any older than ten, placed a few coins into the man's hand. The thug looked into his palm and nodded. The girl shuffled away and disappeared inside the building. It was clear to Kayla that the girl knew where she was going. She had probably been here many times before. The man stashed the coins in his pocket and beckoned the next child forward. The child climbed out of the truck and dropped a few more coins into the thug's palm. Again, the man nodded and the child shuffled away. Bile rose in Kayla's throat. These children were being forced to beg. They were kept in poverty for the benefit of this disgusting man and his organisation. When it looked as though all of the children were out of the truck, the big man bellowed again. The smaller man climbed up into the back of the truck and disappeared in the gloom. He emerged a moment later, dragging a young boy by the arm. Rahul. Rahul struggled against his captor but was easily overpowered. He was forced from the truck and stood in front of the boss. Rahul tried to struggle, but the smaller man held him firm. The boss man held out his hand. Rahul removed a solitary coin from his pocket and dropped it into the boss man's hand. Good boy, Kayla said, finding the boy's refusal to give up the money she had given him seriously impressive. 
In one swift movement, the big man's hand became a fist and then crashed into Rahul's stomach. Rahul bent over, wheezing and gasping. Kayla fought the compulsion to go over there right now. Grown men who beat up children were cowards and she would take them on all day long. The smaller man straightened Rahul up. The boss man forced his hands inside Rahul's pockets and pulled out the small bundle of notes Kayla had given him. The boss man glared at the notes and then Rahul, then commanded the smaller man to drag Rahul inside. The boss man glanced around the street as though checking that no one was nearby. Kayla pulled herself in further behind the oil drum. When the boss man was satisfied that the street was empty, he lumbered inside. Kayla stood up and faced the crumbling building. She'd read about humans doing abhorrent things to those who couldn't fight back, but seeing it for herself was something different altogether. Rage pounded through each sense and synapse and sinew. Rahul. Rahul fought as he was dragged by his neck deep into the bowels of the building. Hey, get off me, get off me. His weakened voice echoed from the walls. He lashed out, but he was thin and malnourished, not even a match for Weasel, and certainly no match for Boss Man. Weasel flung Rahul into the room at the back of the building. The room was large, with several smaller openings on one wall. A series of thick metal doors made these small rooms into the cells where Rahul and the other children slept. Rahul squinted against the light, which was just a bare bulb hanging from the ceiling. He had hoped never to see this place ever again. Rahul scrambled to his feet as quickly as he could, methods of escape streaming through his mind. He was quicker than these men, and they knew it. They had been lucky so far. This time he would run so fast and so far that they would never see him again. Rahul looked around the space. The other children cowered in the darkness. He spun on his heels and looked back at the doorway. Maybe he should make another go of it now. Get out there and... It's OK, Rahul, my young special friend. It was the voice Rahul hated more than any in the world, whispering from somewhere out of the darkness. Your work for the day is done. Now all you need to do is sit back and relax. We are spending tonight together as a family. Rahul shivered, his muscles tensed. The boss man's huge frame filled the doorway, a cigarette glowing from his giant paw. You are one of us, you know. You are a member of this family. The man stepped forwards and sunk to his knees. You are a member of this family whether you like it or not, but you keep running away. Why is that? Rahul said nothing. The boss took another drag on the cigarette and then exhaled the smoke in Rahul's face. My friend over there, the boss man pointed at Weasel, thinks I should beat you again, but I've done that already. The boss tore open Rahul's shirt to reveal his torso bruised and blooded from last night's savage beating. That didn't seem to work, did it? The boss said, poking at one of the welts. Rahul winced and inhaled sharply. I've got a better idea, the boss man said, straightening up. I think you feel you need to keep running away because you don't feel like you belong in this family. I think you feel like you are better than us. Maybe you feel like you want to go back to your palace and be the prince again. <laughs> the boss roared with laughter. <laughs> Weasel laughed too, sounding like a congested mammal. I've got a better idea, the boss said. Maybe you don't feel like you're part of this family because you've never been initiated. Uh, in initiated, Rahul said. Yes. Like a, like a special treat, so that you know you are like us, make you official member of the family. What do you think? The boss's eyes rooted Rahul to the spot. 
Rahul had heard about some of these initiation ceremonies. Sometimes they had to sing a Hindi folk song or steal a loaf of bread from a street baker. It didn't sound so difficult. Rahul nodded. Very good, Rahul, my brave friend. The boss threw a glance at Weasel. It is time. Weasel walked to the back of the room and returned with two chairs and a black holdall. He set the chairs down two feet apart in the centre of the room. Rahul, please take a seat. The boss pointed to one chair. I admire you, Rahul. Many are afraid and try to run away. Rahul sat down in the chair and then looked up at the boss. Very good, Rahul. Do you know what job you will do for us? Rahul nodded. Begging? That is correct. The boss sucked hard on his cigarette. But ordinary begging is for ordinary boys, Rahul. You are a strong boy. You will be a special beggar. Rahul gulped back the lump in his throat. You will make me so proud, Rahul. Now lift your leg up and place it on that chair. Uncertainty flashed across Rahul's face. He blinked it away and raised his leg. The other children watched in shocked silence from the shadows. Good boy, now close your eyes and think of your favourite food. Can you do that for me, Rahul? Rahul didn't really know what his favourite food was. All he could remember was life on the streets. He'd eaten warm bread a couple of times and once found a packet of potato chips. He supposed they were as good as anything. He closed his eyes and rested his head on the back of the chair. That's good, Rahul. Very good. The boss shot Weasel another glance. Weasel stepped forward and took something from his pocket. Keep thinking of that food, Rahul, the boss repeated. Rahul nodded. Very good, my boy, very good. Now, keep your eyes closed and think of that food. I know you must be hungry. Are you hungry, Rahul? Rahul was starving. He'd last eaten a dozen hours ago, half a dirty apple he'd found on the ground. His stomach trembled. How about chicken? Do you like chicken, Rahul? Rice? How about some chicken and rice? Thoughts of hot chicken and rice sent Rahul's imagination into overdrive. The weasel unscrewed a small glass bottle and tipped some of the contents onto a rag. The weasel placed the rag across Rahul's nose and mouth. Two minutes. Go! The boss shouted. The kids around Rahul now froze in fear, their eyes locked on the horrific scene. Weasel set to work. Using a length of stained rope, he tied Rahul's leg to the chair. Using all his strength, he pulled as tight as he could. Then he took an old belt and looped it around Rahul's leg just above the knee. He tied this off tight too. It was clear that Weasel had done this procedure before. Weasel checked the belt and the rope and then crossed back to the bag. He bent down and removed a hacksaw, its blade glimmering. Kayla. Kayla stepped into the building. Her shallow breathing sounded like a steam train in the silence. She willed herself to breathe more quietly as she tiptoed forwards. From what she could see, the building lay in almost complete darkness. She pushed on slowly, cautiously feeling her way forwards. Even if she had a flashlight now, she could never risk using it. A faint light glowed from a room at the back of the building. Someone or something moved back there. Kayla took another step, her apprehension growing. She kicked something. It clanged along the floor, shattering like a glass bottle. Kayla froze, bracing herself for an attack. Every fibre of her body strained for the madness to come. Nothing happened. Kayla waited ten seconds, then another ten. For a second she considered turning around and running back to the Calaba guesthouse. Then Rahul's face drifted into her mind. 
she remembered his fear-filled eyes as he pleaded silently for help. A little more confident that no one was paying the entrance any attention, Kayla dug out her phone and turned on the flashlight. At first, she kept the lens covered so the light only came out a tiny bit. It was enough to see the surrounding room though. Countless discarded glass beer bottles stood across the floor. An old television sat beside two moth-eaten armchairs in the corner. This looked like the place that those disgusting men unwound after a hard day abusing children. She heard a voice drifting from the room at the back of the building. Although the man spoke a language Kayla didn't understand, she would bet on it being the brute she'd seen outside. Kayla pushed aside her anger and focused on what the room told her about her foe. First, discarded beer bottles equaled weapons, and second, the thugs were probably drunk. Kayla snatched up two bottles and then crossed to the back room and peered through the door. Instantly, she wished she hadn't. Rahul sat slumped on a chair in the centre. He looked unconscious, his head lolling to the side. His left leg was extended up before him and tied to another chair. Several other children looked on in shock. Then, a small rodent-like man removed a hacksaw from a black hold -all. It took Kayla a few seconds to work out what was going on. When she did, her stomach fought to repel her last meal. She held onto the wall for support as the room swayed around her. The rodent-like man looked up at his boss. The boss man nodded, then stepped backwards and puffed on his cigarette. The smaller man drew the saw backwards. He fixed his eyes on the leg he planned to liberate from the boy. Kayla saw it in slow motion. She drew a deep breath. Two men against her was not great odds, but even if they killed her in the process, somehow Kayla's adrenaline fueled mind thought that was okay. The boss man took a drag on the cigarette. The man rodent placed the saw's glinting teeth against Rahul's leg. Kayla glanced from one man to the other. The big brute was clearly in charge, yet the man with the saw had to take priority. Kayla stepped back into the shadows and raised the first beer bottle over her head. She focused in on the rodent man whose muscles tensed in preparation to make the first cut. Kayla flung the bottle as hard as she could. It sailed harmlessly over rodent man's head and shattered against the wall. Although causing no damage, the bottle provided the distraction she needed. Both men froze and turned to face the sound. Kayla charged across the room in four controlled steps. She planted her left foot and swung her right up and hard into the rodent man's jaw. Still facing the shattered bottle on the wall behind, he didn't even see her coming. Kayla followed the strike with a pair of elbow strikes to the top of his skull. The man's eyes clouded over. He crumpled to the floor, out cold. The saw clanged down beside him. Kayla spun around to face the boss. Several stunned children looked back at her. The boss man had disappeared. You coward, Kayla shouted. Untie him, quickly. She pointed at the boy, making her meaning clear, even if the children didn't understand the words. Two of the older children rushed across to help. Kayla quickly spun back around and kicked the rodent man twice more for good measure. The last thing she wanted was him waking up halfway through his nap time. Kayla picked up the saw. It was about 18 inches long with hundreds of small, sharp teeth. She turned back to face the doorway. A series of thumps and bangs echoed through. It sounded as though the boss man was upending a toolbox. Kayla charged for the doorway, then saw the boss man running back in her direction. Something about the way he ran told Kayla he was used to fighting. The blade of a large knife glinted from his hand. Kayla pulled in close to the wall beside the door. Solutions spun through her mind. Holding the saw tightly, she sunk into a crouch. She carefully positioned the saw, teeth facing towards her assailant. Feet slapped against concrete in the next room. Kayla swung the saw just as the boss man charged through the door. The teeth buried themselves deep into his thigh. The saw was ripped from her grip. The boss man 
cried in pain and staggered forwards, just managing to catch his fall at the last moment. Kayla leapt to her feet and turned. The boss man glanced down at his leg. Blood now pumped from a four-inch gash on his thigh. It was a significant injury, but it was still clearly not his priority. He looked at Kayla and then snarled. The children had untied Rahul and now watched the unfolding drama from the shadows at the far side of the room. The boss stepped forwards, swinging the blade slowly from left to right. Kayla hated to admit it, but he handled the blade as though he knew what he was doing. Blood spewed from the deep gash on his leg, further staining his filthy trousers. Why don't you just run now? Kayla said, forcing a commanding tone into her voice. You've seen what I've done to your friend? She pointed down at the weasel lookalike. The boss didn't reply. Kayla shuffled to the side, expanding her options, and then sunk into her fighting stance. The boss growled like a caged beast and then dashed forwards. He swung the knife in an arc, the blade zinging through the air. Kayla stepped to the left. The blade swished an inch past her ear. She moved her weight to the other foot and delivered two left hooks to the man's stomach. It felt like she'd just gone one-two on a steel post. The hefty blows only seemed to further anger the brute. He swung the blade again, this time aiming for Kayla's midriff. Kayla stepped backwards and the knife found nothing but air. Kayla shot a glance behind her. She was getting dangerously close to the corner of the room. That was a place she didn't want to be. She swung a right jab. The boss man twisted the knife and the blade sliced across the top of Kayla's arm. A white hot pain surged through her body. She winced and ducked backwards. She was now even further into the corner. The boss man advanced again. A snarl played at the corners of his lips as he realised he was gaining the upper hand. Kayla ducked. The knife missed her throat by a hair's breadth. She stepped back again and felt the wall with her back foot. She was trapped, exactly where she didn't want to be. The boss man smiled and took another step forwards. His movements were now almost leisurely. He clearly thought he'd already won. Kayla had one play left. One move, which although dangerous, could disarm the brute. Kayla ran the combo through her mind. It was a move she hadn't used in years and didn't remember that well. Right now though, she didn't have any other options. She stood tall, tempting the man to strike. The brute's dark eyes passed across her body and then he took the bait. The knife sped towards her stomach. Kayla did exactly what the man didn't expect. She stepped towards the incoming blade. She twisted side on, offering a smaller target and then struck. The knife passed an inch in front of her stomach. Kayla gripped the man's wrist beneath the elbow, rendering the knife useless. Then she cracked her palm into his upper arm. Bones shattered deep beneath his skin. The big man cried in pain and the knife clanged to the floor. Kayla delivered three heavy punches to the side of his head and then shoved his body to the floor. The man fell like a banyan tree. His head flopped backwards and cracked against the concrete. Quick, let's get you out of here, Kayla said, pointing to the children. As the children shuffled towards the door, Kayla went through the big man's pockets and removed the keys to the truck and the wad of coins and cash she'd seen him collect from the kids. With a glance back at the men, Kayla followed the liberated children out into the other room. Wait, wait, Rahul said, coming around from the drugs. Oh, over there. He pointed at a small metal box beside the TV. One of the other kids rushed over and swung open the lid. Filthy notes were bundled into piles. The kids snagged up the box and they headed out to the truck. Kayla climbed into the driver's seat and started the engine. Rahul got in beside her, along with another of the older kids. Kayla started the engine. The old truck spluttered, coughed and then roared to life. Kayla glanced at Rahul. I've got something for you, she said, handing him the notes she'd first given to him outside Leopold several hours ago. But this time, they're really yours to keep. Thank you, Rahul said, tucking the notes away. Where are we going then? Kayla asked, reversing the truck towards the main road. Head south, Rahul said, 
leaning back into his seat. I want to go south. That was Slumdog Escape by me, Luke Richardson, and Stephen Moore. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Thriller Vault podcast. Please, please, please make sure you're liking, you're subscribing, and you're sharing this podcast as it helps us so much reach new readers. I can't wait to share another story with you soon. Thanks. <laughs>